السنة مثل سفينة نوح من ركبها نجا ومن تركها غرق الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق يذهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد أستوى الفسيس إخواني وأخواتي وأبنائي وبناتي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته عليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته In our previous meeting Sheikh Al-Islam Abu Al-Wafathana Wa La Amri Sari Rahmatullah Ali Was discussing the issue of Ilm Al-Ghayb After mentioning the Adilla Or the evidences from the Quran The Sheikh Rahimullah Ta'ala followed that with evidences that can be found in the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in the seerah of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well as mentioning clear explicit evidence from the noble prophets and messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly indicating that nobody from amongst the creation had knowledge of the unseen ilm al ghayb The Shaykh rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned firstly he mentioned the incident of Umm al-Mu'mineen Aishat bint Abi Bakr radiyallahu anhuma Siddiqa bint Siddiq and the famous incident known as Qissat al-Ifq that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not know or have knowledge of what had really happened until revelation came we found in Surah al Surah Al-Nur and the famous hadith in Sahih Al-Bukhar. Then the Shaykh mentioned the incident of Ibrahim alayhi salam not knowing that the guest that had come uh, the guest that came to him or the guest that had come to him was an angel as mentioned in Surah Hud and Surah Al-Dhariyat. The Shaykh Rahimahullah, he then mentioned Lut alayhi salam and the angels, the Malaika, being his guest. Surah Al-Shura and in Surah Al-Ankabut. Also the Shaykh mentioned that in the Quran it's clearly mentioned when Musa alayhi salam returned back from Tur, he interrogated his brother. Harun alayhi salam with regards to what his people had done and committed. So the Sheikh mentioned all these evidences to show from the Quran that nobody from amongst the creation, no matter how great they were in status, and from amongst the creation, the prophets and the messengers including our beloved Prophet Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that anyone amongst them had knowledge of the unseen or had uh, knowledge of ilm al ghayb al-mutlaq. The Shaykh rahimahullah ta'ala after that mentioned uh, he mentioned a mas'ala, al-mas'ala al-fiqhiyya a fiqh issue that can be found in the books of the, the Hanafi
Hanafi jurists, Fuqaha al Hanafiya, that if a man and a woman were to marry each other, and if the man and the woman were to say that our witnesses with regards to our marriage is Allah and Allah's messenger, then this would be considered to be kufr. Because by saying that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a witness, is to believe that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knows the knowledge of the unseen. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not know the knowledge of the unseen when he was alive. How could he have known or possessed the knowledge of the unseen after he passed away? And then the Shaykh, he mentioned evidences from other Hanafi scholars which we mentioned last week. And this is where I believe that we stopped last week with regards to what the Shaykh said. Are the students following? No, I'm sure. Then the Shaykh Rahimahullah mentioned The Shaykh, he said, after mentioning all these evidences, he says that, O oh reader, if it has become clear to you that the prophets and the messengers, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, alayhi wa salatu wa salam, did not have knowledge of the unseen, then how can the imams of Ahlul Bayt and the saints and the pious ones, the awliya on the sulaha, of this Ummah have knowledge of the unseen. So the Shaykh, after making Sardul Adilla, after presenting the evidences in their correct context from the Quran and the Sunnah, relating back or uh, in relation to the Prophet or the Prophets and the Messengers and the creation, the Shaykh, he refuted the Shia or the Rafida here by saying that the Shias, they believe that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, the Aimma of Ahlul Bayt, they possessed and they had knowledge of the unseen. And from amongst the Sufis, the Sufis believe that the Awliya, the Awliya or the Sulaha, the pious ones, or the Buzuruks, like they say, the living and dead amongst them have knowledge of the unseen. So the Shaykh said, how, how can this be? That to believe in such a belief that the awliya or the aimma of Ahlul Bayt have knowledge of the unseen goes against Quran and the Sunnah and the Ijma of the Muslim Ummah. And then the Shaykh he presented some arguments. He said, Some people argue that Allah has said in the following ayah with regards to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with regards to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa ma lam takun ta'lam, wa kana fadlullahi alayka azim. And Allah has taught you that which you did not know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He taught you. But he, Allah, taught you that which you did not know. And ever has the favor of Allah upon you been great. Surah An Nisa, ayah number 113. Ahlul Bidah used this ayah to prove that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam possessed and had knowledge of the unseen. Surah An Nisa, ayah number 113. So the people of Bidah, the people of innovation or the deviated sects, they say, so when this ayah, it can be argued that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had knowledge of all things and the unseen. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَعَلَّمَكَ مَا لَمْ تَكُنْتَ So this is the ishkal. This is the ishkal or the itiraq or the argument. Surah An-Nisa, ayah number 113. This is evidence 
the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had knowledge of the unseen. And I always say to students that do not be amazed or dazzled when people quote evidence. Quoting evidence is something which is very easy and simple. To correct or to quote the evidence in its correct context and in its, with its correct understanding and meaning, this is something which is difficult and this is something which only the Ahlul Hadith have mastered and the Ahlul Hadith are able and capable of doing so. So do we understand the, the argument presented by Ahlul Bidah? وَعَلَّمَكَ مَا لَمْ تَكُنْ تَعْلَمْ وَكَانَ فَضُلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ عَظِيمًا Somebody came to you from the Baralwis and said that this is an ayah to prove that the Prophet had knowledge of the unseen when Allah said وَعَلَّمَكَ مَا لَمْ تَكُنْ تَعْلَمْ أَلَا كُلِّ حَالَ اللَّهِ الشَّيْخُ الْإِسْلَامِ أَبُوَ الْوَفَاءَ سَنَا وَلَا أَمْرِ سَرِي رَحْمُتُ اللَّهِ He says in response, he states that the letter ma in this ayah وَعَلَّمَكَ مَا لَمْ تَكُنْ تَعْلَمْ That has been used in this ayah which is translated and understood as everything. وَعَلَّمَكَ مَا لَمْ تَكُنْ تَعْلَمْ The railways and the Sufiya, they say that the word ma which is a half in the Arabic language and which is am and general they say that this refers to everything in general. And this is why they say that when Allah SWT said, وَعَلَّمَكَ مَا لَمْ تَكُنْ تَعْلَمْ Allah SWT taught you everything that you did not know. That's why I say that when you refer back to the translations of the Qur'an, be very careful of how or what translations that you read. Because every single translation, its background is going to be with regards to the belief of the sect that the translator adheres to. So the Brahmiya and the Sufiya, they say that the word ma here refers to everything. In response, the Sheikh, he gives a response by saying that the letter ma which has been mentioned in this ayah, if it, if it refers to everything as you claim, then there is another ayah in which we find that the letter ma has been used for all the Muslims. So if it means that the Prophet ﷺ has knowledge of everything, then you will have to say that the word ma in the ayah in which the Muslims have been mentioned will also mean that the Muslims have knowledge of the unseen of everything and nobody believes that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 151, where he said, ma lam And teaching you that which you did not know. Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 151. So if you say that the word ma here refers to everything, then you are compelled to say that the word ma in Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 151, also means everything. So in that case, also the Muslims, and nobody believes this, no foolish person will believe this, that the Muslims also have knowledge of the unseen. They have knowledge of everything of the unseen, and nobody believes that. One, you understand the response of the Sheikh that he used the same principle and the same argument that is used by them. And this is the genius of how the Sheikh is such a great genius and intelligent and so smart. That he looks at the argument and the context that they use. That he brings an ayah in which they can't say that the word ma here does not refer to everything. And because if they say that the word ma here refers to something and not everything, then they have to give evidence for that. So the Sheikh, he says that if you believe this, if you believe this, then you have to believe that the Muslims all have knowledge of the unseen based upon Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 151. In fact, the Sheikh, he says, so rather we find that Allah informed us of all human beings, that even human beings have knowledge that includes disbelievers, the kuffar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Surah Al-Alaq, where he says, Surah Al-Alaq, where he says, Allama al-insana ma'ala ya'ala. The word ma has been used here as well. He taught man that which he knew not. So here the word ma has been taught to mean that. And no one uses the meaning here of knowing everything. So if you use the word ma in the first ayah which we quoted, in Surah An-Nisa, ayah number 113, to mean everything, you have to translate the word ma in Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 
151 to also mean everything. And also in Surah Al-Alaq, for when Allah SWT said, Allama al-insana ma'alakana. And al-insan includes everyone. Includes the Muslims as well as the Kuffar. And nobody believes that the Kuffar as well as the Muslims have had knowledge of the unseen. Everything with regards to the knowledge of the unseen. That they had knowledge of everything. So the Sheikh says, so now will we say that the whole of mankind knows knowledge of the unseen? La abad. Kalla wa hasha. So the Sheikh, he says, with regards to this, we clearly understand that the word man does not refer to everything. And it does not refer to as the people have understood it. Then the Sheikh, he gives it the tafsir of this ayah and explains based upon the tafsir of the Salaf. He says that, and the correct meaning and the context of the eye ascribed to the Messenger of Allah is that the knowledge that you possess now with regards to the deen that Allah taught him that. In the same manner, the Muslims who had no knowledge of the deen were taught these issues of the deen. So the Shaykh he says that the correct meaning or the understanding, the fahm of this ayah is that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not have knowledge of the deen. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not have knowledge of this deen. Al-ilm al-shari. Al-ilm al-shari was taught to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the very same way, the Muslims, they did not have knowledge of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were taught the knowledge of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who taught his companions, who taught their companions and who taught their companions until this day of ours. Until this day and age. When you ask to al-insan, allam al-insan, that this is in general knowledge of the deen and knowledge of the dunya. The inventions that we see, the innovative creation that we see, that modern technology that we see that is developed by the human being and it's ascribed to the human being's intelligence in reality it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has taught that has taught mankind that which he is not so this is what the shaykh he says that it means that you possess now with regards to the deen that Allah taught him that in the same manner the Muslims who had no knowledge of the deen were taught these issues of the deen so the shaykh he says that the correct meaning or the understanding, the fahm of this ayah, is that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa did not have knowledge of the deen. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa did not have knowledge of this deen. Al-ilm al-shari. Al-ilm al-shari was taught to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the very same way, the Muslims, they did not have knowledge of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were taught the knowledge of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who taught his companions, who taught their companions and who taught their companions until this day of ours. Until this day and age. When you guys to al-insan, allam al-insan, and this is in general, knowledge of the deen and knowledge of the dunya. The inventions that we see, the innovative creation that we see, that modern technology that we see that is developed by the human being and it's ascribed to the human being's intelligence. In reality, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has taught that has taught mankind that which he is not. So this is what the Shaykh he says that it means. When it refers to the Messenger of Allah and the Muslim, it refers to the Deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When it refers to mankind, then it refers to general knowledge, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught mankind, that which is present amongst us in the 21st century, in this day and age of ours. Now, is this clear so far? Is the issue clear? Is the issue clear with regards to ma? So ma in this ayah is referring to that, not with regards to everything, that is possessed or that is no every single thing then the shaykh gives another ayah of the quran 
in which he explains the uh, the aforementioned ayah of Surah Nisa, ayah number 113, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, with regards when he addressed the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and this destroys the argument that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had knowledge of the unseen, al ghaybul mutlaq, like they claim, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا كُنْتَ تَدْرِي مَا الْكِتَابُ وَلَا الْإِيمَانِ وَلَكِنْ جَعَلْنَاهُ نُورًا يَهْدِي بِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا فَإِنَّكَ لَتَهْدِي إِلَى صِرَاطِ مُسْتَقِيمٍ That you did not know what is in the book or what is Iman, but we have made it a light by which we guide whom we will of our servants. And indeed, O Muhammad, you guide to a straight path. Surah Shura, ayah number 152. Surah to Shura, ayah number 152, explains uh, Surah to Nisa. Ayah number 113, that this ayah does not refer to that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had knowledge of the unseen of everything as this ayah against the fact that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not know what is in the book until he was taught what is in the book, in the kalam of Allah. And he did not know what is iman until he was taught what is iman by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is clear from this ayah that the shaykh says that the knowledge that can be found in the Quran was taught to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That the knowledge that can be found in the book of Allah was taught to the Prophet Nobody calls this knowledge of the unseen. And nobody disputes or rejects this. Everybody knows that the knowledge that the Prophet was taught and that can be found in the Quran, the knowledge of the Quran, was something which the Prophet was taught. And this was not something which is considered to be ilm al from that perspective. Or anybody that rejects this. So is it clear how the Shaykh, rahimahullah ta'ala, Brings one ayah and another ayah and another ayah and then brings another ayah to explain another ayah. No, I'm sure. And can you see the intelligence of the Shaykh Rahimullah Ta'ala of how sharp the Shaykh is? That's why the Shaykh he wrote the tafsir of the Quran. Tafsir of the Quran bi kalam rahman. He wrote a whole tafsir of the Quran explaining an ayah explaining another ayah. Nothing. So he wrote the whole tafsir of the Quran by just the Quran. He wrote a tafsir of the Quran explained by the Qur'an, an ayah explaining another ayah, which is the best way of making tafsir of an ayah for the whole Qur'an. This tafsir is written in the Arabic language, and it is something which every single Dalib al I believe, should have, because by referring to this, we will see. The amazing thing is that people write tafsir, and many of us have wrote tafsir. Either the tafsir is from their own ijtihadat, based upon Qur'an and the Sunnah, and they explain this and elaborate this, but the greatest form of tafsir is tafsir al-Qur'ani bil-Qur'an. And the Shaykh wrote a tafsir called tafsir al-Qur'ani bi kalami rahman which has been published by Darul Salaam and which is available. So, every, so a talib al-ilm should make an effort of, uh, of, of trying to uh, purchase this tafsir. As you can see that this is a tafsir, tafsir al-Qur'an bi kalami rahman This was written by Abu al-Wafasin wa al-Amri sari rahmatullah alayhi. As you can see, and the whole tafsir of the Qur'an is only with tafsir of the Qur'an, only ayat, nothing else. He explained the whole tafsir of the Qur'an by the Qur'an, by ayats of the Qur'an. One ayah explaining another ayah. And this is something which is amazing, it's in the Arabic language, published by Dawah salam And it is something which a Talib al should buy. This tafsir of the Qur'an has been praised by all the people of knowledge, and has been praised by the Mufassirun of his time to be something which is amazing. So we know the shubha and the doubt which the people of Nar, the people of Bida bring with regards to the ayah wa alama kamalam takun ta'lam in Surah An-Nisa ayah number 113 and we have also come to know how the Shaykh answered this by saying that the, if the letter ma in the Arabic language refers to everything that this is incorrect. As if you say that the letter ma here in the Arabic language refers to everything, then in the other ayahs which the Shaykh mentioned, then you will have to also believe that the Muslims had knowledge of the unseen. You will also have to believe that even the kuffar and the insan had knowledge of the unseen, which nobody believes uh, rationally. And it would be uh, irrational to believe in such a belief. Now, then the Shaykh Rahimullah said that it is said that there is a narration with the following, with the following wording. So the Shaykh firstly brought a doubt which the people bring and they, and they deduce or they base this doubt upon an ayah which can be found in the Qur'an which is وَعَلَّمَكَ مَا لَمْ تَكُنْ Surah An-Nisa, ayah number 113. Now the Shaykh he brought a narration. He said that there is a narration with the following words. 
اوتيت علم الاولين والاخرين اوتيت علم الاولين والاخرين the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that i have been given the knowledge of those who are from amongst the first of people and those who will be from amongst the last of people which the Sheikh quoted, and he said that uh, they bring a doubt and they quote this narration. Is everybody clear with regards to this narration? Do we understand what he means by Al-Awwaleen? Al-Awwaleen are the people who came first before the Prophet Al-Akhirin are the people that will come. The Prophet said, I have been given all that knowledge that will be given to the people who came before me and who will come after me. Do you understand this? No, I'm sure. From this, we understand what can be understood from this is that the people of innovation, they try by saying that this narration uh, indicates that the Prophet ﷺ had knowledge of the unseen. Well, then, do we understand the doubt? No, I'm sure. Why they bring this narration? Now, when I thoroughly researched with regards to this narration, looking for the reference for this narration, I researched not uh, of how I would have liked to have researched, but I researched briefly that I could not find the reference of this hadith with this way, except in the books of the Sufis. I could not find a hadith with the exact wording of Utitu ilmu al wal akhir from the masadir and the maraji that we have from the kutub of the sunnah and the kutub al ahadith. I could not find this reference. All I know is that this type of reference, Utitu ilmu al wal akhir, can be found in the books of the Sufis. For example, I found the wording, Fa'arintu ilmu al awwalin wal akhir. And then I knew the knowledge of those who were before me and those who will be after me. Then I learned. Or I um, attained. So this is the way that we find. Wallahu Adam, where the Shaykh quoted this narration from. So I could not find the wording of this hadith as mentioned by the Sufis. Even this wording, so we find two types of wording. The first wording which the Shri quoted, which is Utitu ilmu al wal The second is Fa'alimtu ilmu al wal The first is quoted by the Sheikh, the second is quoted by the Sufis. It seems as though, Wallahu A'lam, from what I understand, is that this narration was quite widely spread amongst the time of the Shaykh. And used by the Sufis. So the Shaykh just quoted this reference and answered that if this reference is to be considered to be authentic, that even then you cannot use this as evidence to prove that the Prophet ﷺ had knowledge of the unseen. As we shall see when I shall explain this in the later part of this lesson. But do we understand the argument now? First of all, the narration which Sheikh Rahimullah quoted in his book. With this wording, and we cannot find the narration. And we have another wording, فَعَلِمْتُ إِلْمَ الْأَوَّلِينَ وَالْأَخِرِينَ So, then we find the wording of the Sufis. The Sufis have mentioned this in their books, explaining that this narration, فَعَلِمْتُ إِلْمَ الْأَوَّلِينَ now, this narration can be found in the books of Sunnah, like Mustad Ahmad and Al Jami Al Kabir or Al Jami Al Tirmidhi. This is where you find that when I check the books of the Sufis, I found that they reference this narration. Back to Mustad Ahmad and Al Jami Al Kabir or is it clear? No, I'm sure. So what we find is 
that the Sufis and Ahl al bidah they do not, when they <coughs> reference something, they do not reference it correctly with the exact wording. So now in front of us we have a shubha, we have a doubt. A narration which the Shaykh quoted, Utitu ilmu al wal A narration which is quoted by the Sufis, فَعَلِمْتُ ilmu al awwalina wal And the Sufis reference this going back to Muslim Ahmed and al jami al kabir with regards to understanding the shubha first, with regards to its reference, then I mentioned that the first wording of the narration cannot be found. The second can be found in the books of the Sufis, who ascribe their wording and saying that this narration can be found in the books of Hadith or in the books of Sunan, and they quote um, in general Muslim Ahmad al jabi al Kabir of Imam at Tirmidhi. So there are some important issues. But we need to understand with regards to this narration. The first issue is, like I mentioned, that I could not find the reference quoted by the Sheikh with the exact word. The second is I could not find the reference quoted by the Sufis with the exact word. Meaning, they said that this narration can be found. فَعَلِمْتُ إِلْمَ الْأَوَّلِينَ وَالْآخِرِينَ In Muslim Ahmed and, ja- and, and uh, Sunan al-Tirmidhi or Al-Jami al-Kabir. Thirdly, the references given by the Sufis themselves are inaccurate and not narrated with that wording. This narration, which the Sufis quote, has been narrated with different wordings. So this narration which the Sufis have quoted, فَعَلِمْتُ إِلْمَ الْأَوَّلِينَ وَالْآخِرِينَ This has been narrated with different wordings like فَعَلِمْتُ مَا فِي السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ فَتَجَلَّ لِي مَا بَيْنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ فَتَجَلَّ لِي مَا بَيْنَ الْمَشْرِقِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ فَتَجَلَّ لِي كُلُّ شَيْءٍ وَعَرَفْتُ واضح. So these are the wordings which can be found. فَعَلِمْتُ مَا فِي السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ I knew everything that was that which was in the heavens and the earth. فَتَجَلَّ لِي then everything was disclosed for me that is in between the heavens and the earth. Then everything was disclosed for me between the east and the west. And the wording which can be found in Musnad Ahmad and uh, al jami al-Kabir of Imam al-Tirmidhi known as Sunan al-Tirmidhi is kullu shay'in wa Then Everything was disclosed for me, and I became aware of it. So this hadith has been narrated by Imam At-Tirmidhi in his al jam hadith number 3235. Are the students understanding so far what is going on? Do we understand from the beginning till the end? The Shaykh Rahimullah quoted a narration, Utitu. We could not find the narration with this word. The Sufis quote the narration and they say there is a narration which can be found in Muslim Ahmad and as Sunan al Tirmidhi or Al Jami al Kabir of Imam al Tirmidhi. We say that again that this narration which they mentioned in Muslim Ahmad and Sunan al Tirmidhi, with this wording, فَعَلِمْتُ إِلْمَ الْأَوَّلِينَ وَالْآخِرِينَ cannot be found. But we find that there is other wordings which have been reported in the books of the Sunnah, such as the Prophet I'm saying, فَعَلِمْتُ مَا فِي السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ فَتَجَلَّ لِي مَا بَيْنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ فَتَجَلَّ لِي مَا بَيْنَ الْمَشْرِقِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ and فَتَجَلَّ لِي كُلُّ شَيْءٍ وَعَرَفْتُ Everything was disclosed for me and I became aware of it. And this is the strongest wording of evidence because the word kullu has been mentioned everything so there's no doubt in all the other narrations the word ma has been mentioned like we said that the word ma is debatable can it be referring to everything or can it be referring to something else but the word kullu in the arabic language means everything and the wording of fatajalla li kullu shay'in wa'araftu has been narrated by imam at-tirmidhi 
in his al jami hadith number 3235. Well, after narrating this narration, which فَدَجَلَّ لِي كُلُّ شَيْءٍ وَعَرَفْتُهُ Imam Al-Tirmidhi, after narrating this narration, says, هَذَا حَدِيثٌ حَسَنٌ سَحِيٌ This narration is Hassan Sahih. And then he says, سَعَلْتُ مُحَمَّدُ بِنْ إِسْمَعِيلِ سَعَلْتُ مُحَمَّدُ بِنْ إِسْمَعِيلِ عن هذا الحديث فقال هذا حديث حسن صحيح he said I asked Imam Al-Bukhari with regards to this narration who said that this narration is حسن صحيح so At-Tirmidhi and his sheikh Amir Al-Mu'minin of the Hadith Imam Al-Dunya, Imam Al-Bukhari declared this narration to be sahih واضح. Yeah. Clear so far. Yeah. So this narration which has a similar meaning to what the Sheikh quoted وَتِيتُ إِلْمُ الْأَوَّلِينَ وَالْآخِرِينَ Imam Al-Bukhari has declared this narration to be authentic. Imam Al-Tirmidhi has that, uh, declared this narration to be authentic. This narration can also be found. The narration which I mentioned in the Al-Jami Al-Kabir of Imam Al-Tirmidhi in Rasul Al-Tirmidhi can be found in Musnad Ahmad, Al-Ilal Al-Kabir of Al-Tirmidhi, Kitab Al-Tawheed of Imam Ibn Khuzayma, Al-Tabrani in his Al-Mu'jib Al-Kabir, Tahdeeb Al-Kamal, Tahdeeb Al-Kamal of Al-Mizzi, Tuhfat Al-Ashraf, and other books of the Sunnah. So somebody asked me where this narration can be found. فَتَجَلَّ لِي كُلُّ شَيْءٍ وَعَرَفْتُ فَعِيدٍ That which we can 3,235 is that a lot of people they say that At-Tirmidhi was the first person to use the word Hassan but there you go in Imam At-Tirmidhi's Al-Jami Al-Kabir we find Al-Bukhari using the terminology Hada Hadithun Hassan al sahih meaning that the concept of a Hadith being Hassan was something which was known to the scholars before Al-Imam At-Tirmidhi Rahimahullah Ta'ala although Imam At-Tirmidhi is the one who used this terminology constantly and he became a pioneer of spreading this terminology of hadith al hasan as we know that before him the categorization of hadith was only sahih and ba'if and when the ulama would use ba'if they would also incorporate it within it hadith al hasan as mentioned by the scholars such as shaykh al-islam ibn Taymiyyah. but here we find al-bukhari rahimahullah mentioning the word hasan al sahih meaning making a distinction between Hadith and Hassan and between Hadith and Hassan and Sahih. Wallahu a'ala. Now, so the Hadith with regards to this word can be found. فَتَجَلَّ لِي كُلُّ شَيْءٍ وَعَرَفْتُ So how do we answer this now? The narration is authentic uh, with regards to this narration authenticated by Al-Bukhari and Imam Al-Tib. Some scholars such as Imam Yahya ibn Ma'i and Ad-Dar Qutni and others have weakened this narration because of this narration having ittira. But now, for the sake of the argument, we don't want to get into the takhrij of this hadith whether this narration is authentic or not. But let's say for the sake of argument that we go by what Bukhari and what Imam Al-Tib said. There's a person may come to you and he said, Imam al-Bukhari Amir al declared this narration to be sahih. And this narration is used by the people of Bidak to say that the wording of the hadith is clear. فَتَجَلَّ لِي كُلُّ شَيْءٍ وَعَرَفْتُ And everything, every single thing was disclosed to me and I became aware of it. Is used to prove that the Prophet ﷺ had knowledge of the unseen. Now, how would we answer this argument? Because we're coming to the end of Ilm this Ghaib. issue of Ilm al-Ghayb. This is one of the last issues that needs to be discussed. Or as we know that this book does not deal with the specific topic of Ilm al-Ghayb. Inshallah, there are books which have been written by the ulama on regards to the issue of Ilm al-Ghayb. Uh, which, which, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, we shall study in the near future. But what I have given you with regards in the few past few weeks with regards to Ilm al-Ghayb. If you want to study this carefully and if you were to 
ponder over and contemplate over your notes and compile them and study them thoroughly, then inshallah, no one would be able to um, give you or fool you or discuss with you if they had principles. Because the way I explain everything is just as the people of knowledge taken this back from the, from the books of the people of knowledge, is that every single ayah is in its correct context based upon a, 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 a feasible principle. Whereas if you quote one ayah, then you dismiss another, another ayah. So everything, all the evidences that can be found in the Quran and the Sunnah have been reconciled. Reconciled with a principle that stands to show al ghaib al mutlaq is something which is khas for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And some parts of al ghaib al mutlaq was done to mankind where there is no explicit evidence to show that this was something which was specifically for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But with regards to the narration which the Shaykh quoted, which is Utitu ilmu al wal which has the same meaning with regards to the narration that can be found in Al Tirmidhi and others with the wording of Fatajalla Ali Kullu Shaykhin wa Araftu. And the Shaykh he explains the narration that he explains this mean the meaning of this narration that even if you want to accept as the Sufis claim it to be with the with, with the specific wording. The Sheikh responds back and he says that it would mean that whatever knowledge was granted to the people before me, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying that whatever knowledge was granted to the people before me, meaning al awwali it was granted to me. So whatever the people that came before me, the knowledge that was given to them with regards to the deen of Allah, this includes the prophets and the messengers who are uh, the utmost highest in status. The whole system said that I was granted this knowledge. Or that it will be granted to the people who will come after me, well, akhiri, after I pass away. Then that knowledge that, they, that will be granted to them also, that that knowledge has been given to me. And this is the knowledge of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the Shaykh explains how. The Shaykh says the reason for this is, or the illa, is, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Sayyidu Waladi Adam, is the leader of the children of Adam. And he is the most pious amongst them, has the most taqwa and the most khash. Allah SWT mentions in the Quran, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاء That the, the people who have the most khashya or fear Allah SWT the most are the ulama. And the reason of why the ulama are at the top is because of their knowledge. So the Prophet had the most knowledge. Because he had the most knowledge, he was the most pious. Because he was the most pious, the reason of that is because he was the he is the leader of the children of Adam. He is the one of the Adam. So this is what it means when the Prophet said, Ilmul Awwalina wal Akhir. That I have been given the knowledge of the Awwalina wal Akhir. And this is something which nobody can disagree with this concept. So we also believe that the Prophet Sallallahu was A'namul Khalq. He was the most knowledgeable when it came to the deen of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala from amongst the creation of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Wadih? Naam, Shaykh, wadih. Is it clear of how this not, uh, of what is meant by ilmul awwalina wal akhiri? Naam, when it goes to the issue of al-ghayb al-mutlaq, barakallahu feekum, then this is something which is wadih. The most amazing thing which you must understand here which no Parelvi or Diobandi or a person of Suf, uh, a, a Sufi can argue with you is that they do not take Al Akbar Al Ahad Fi Bab Al Aqeeda. And all these narrations which they are quoting to prove in Mulghayb are all from Mimbab Al Akbar in Mimbab Al Akbar Al Ahad. If they don't take Akbar Al Ahad in the Bab of Fiqh, how can they take Akbar al Ahad when it comes to the Aqidah? Do you understand the question? This is the easiest way to destroy them based upon this principle. So you leave the ayah of the Quran, the Lilul Qat'i, which clearly says that the Prophet did not have knowledge of the unseen. And then you take this narration, which there is the out, apparent contradiction now between a Quranic ayah and a hadith. And it is from your usul that if there is a contradiction between an ayah and a hadith, and the ayah is always given preference. This is something which the Hanafis always quote. 
this is how they run away. Because they cannot reconcile, they say, that if there is Dalil al Qat'i, which contradicts apparently with Dalil al Dhanni, which is Akhbar al Ahad, or if there is a hadith which contradicts the Quran, the Quran is more visible preference. So we say to them, first of all, you do not use Akhbar al Ahad in the Bab of Fiqh, then how are you using it in Bab al Aqeedah? And it is from your principles, and your, from your Usul al Fiqh, that if an eye and a hadith contradict each other, then the hadith will be abandoned and the ayah will be achieved. Wadih. Naam, Sheikh Wadih. And they can never answer this. Ala kulli hal, kama la yakhfa alaykum, as it is not hidden to all of you, then you should understand that when there is ta'arud, an apparent contradiction between a Quranic ayah and a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, based upon the usul of the Balilwiyah and the Ubadiyah. And their usul says the hadith will be abandoned and the Quranic ayah will be adhered to. Hada alaw. Wathani that the Balilwiyahs and the Ubadiyahs are in agreement that with Akhbar al Ahad. They do not take narrations which are akhbar al-ahad when it comes to many of the masail and fiqhiyya. So then how can they take narrations which are ahad when it comes to babu A contradiction in their usul. As aqidah is aham, more important and you have to be more diligent when it comes to your aqidah. Then the, the Masail al Fiqhiyyah. Wadih. Is it clear? Do we understand? No, Shaykh Wadih. And do we understand that the way the Shaykh explained this narration, if you were to accept this narration of Mutitu ilmu al awwalina wal akhirin, what it refers to al awwalina wal akhirin here is al awwalina of those who came before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That the knowledge that they were granted and given knowledge that they were granted and given, meaning from amongst them, those who had the most knowledge before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the Prophets and the Messages. That the knowledge which they have been given, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been given that knowledge. And those who will come after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, meaning those who will be from amongst his Ummah, great scholars will come. And all the knowledge that they will have been given, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had knowledge of all that. Allah SWT gave them that knowledge. That means that all the ijtihadat that the scholars that will come after the Prophet Sallallahu that came after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's knowledge with regards to that would always be more. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi had the most knowledge. That everything that Allah granted to those that will come after him, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have, has been granted that before them. Before their emergence or before their appearance or before their coming. The reason for this is that the Prophet ﷺ is Sayyidu wa the Ad. And the Prophet ﷺ is the last of all the Prophets and the messages. The Prophet ﷺ was sent to the whole of mankind. The Prophet ﷺ is Rahmatul Lil Alameen. And the list goes on and on and on. Based upon this reason, that if, and, and as we know that we have a tawazi, the mawazi that we have, the skills that we have, that the more greater your knowledge, the more closer you can get to Allah. The lesser your knowledge, the lesser that you can get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is this clear? No, I'm sure. So because the Prophet had the most knowledge from amongst the jinn and the ins, when it came to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, well, the Prophet is Sayyidu Waladi Adam. He is the leader of the children of Adam. And the Prophet is the most pious, muttaqi, Therefore, the Prophet ﷺ was given that knowledge, was granted that knowledge for those who came out before him and those who will come after him. This does not mean in any way that the Prophet ﷺ had knowledge of everything that those who came before him or after him. Because the word ilm here is referring to the ilm, the knowledge of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, this was with regards to... Um, the answer which the Sheikh and the explanation which the Sheikh gave. Is that clear? No, Sheikh. Now, if you look at this narration, 
which is quoted by the Sufis, Utitu ilmu al-awwalina wal-akhirin, or alimtu ilmu al-awwalina wal-akhirin. If you look at this, Utitu ilmu al-awwalina wal-akhirin, or ilmu al-awwalina wal-akhirin. If you look at it from the perspective of the Arabic language, then the word ilm in the Arabic language is a master, an infinitive, an infinitive, and it is mudaf, possessive, towards the subject, the doer, fa'il, which is al-awwalina wal So the word ilm in the Arabic language is a master. For those of you who know the Arabic language, and this benefit is for those who have studied the Arabic language. For those who do not know the Arabic language, that don't uh, worry and don't try to understand this, because inshallah when you understand the Arabic language, you can understand. So the word ilm in the Arabic language is a master. It's an infinity. And it is mudaf. It has been ascribed and it's possessive towards the subject or the doer, which is the fa'il, which is al-awwalina wal akhir then the meaning for it to be in accordance to the Arabic language when, some, when a master is mudaf towards the fa'il is that it has to refer to Islamic knowledge, not knowledge absolute. It refers to Islamic knowledge that was granted to those before me or those that will come after me. I have been granted that. And so when we look at it from the perspective of the Arabic language as well, ilm is master when master is mudaf. And it refers to ilmul awwali. What was the knowledge that was given to the awwali wal akhiri? Knowledge of Islam. Is this clear? No. For those who understand the Arabic language. <coughs> no. who, who understood this point from those of you who have studied the Arabic language? Uh, I'm trying to see which of the students I know know Arabic. Um... When a master is mudaf towards the fa'il, the subject or the doer, here is ilm, is mudaf. Al-awwalina wal-akhirin is mudaf wal ilm. Master, when, when, it's, when the master is mudaf towards the fa'il, mudaf wal ilm, then it's something which is restricted. Naam, Sheikh. Restriction here refers to Islamic knowledge, al-ilm al -shar. So the ilm al shari that was granted to those who came before the Prophet and who will come after the Prophet system, Prophet system has been granted all that by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he no, If you want to accept this narration to mean that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa knew knowledge of the unseen. So now for the sake of argument, if you are to agree with the Bilalis on the Sufis, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had ilm al -ghayb. That this narration will contradict the other ayat of the Quran and the other ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa which negate this concept. So we have now this narration. If we isolate this narration and take this narration and base our aqeedah just based upon this narration, to ilmu al-awwalina wal-akhirin or alim to ilmu al-awwalina wal-akhirin by isolation and Overlook all the other narrations that can be found, or all the ayat that can be found, that this will go against what the fuqaha of Ahl Sunnah have understood, who have a consensus and ijma amongst them, that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, did not know knowledge of the unseen. So, if you were to accept this argument by saying, whether well, it's the narration that can be found in the Tirmidhi. أي مصطد أحمد فتجلى لي كل شيء فعرفت تجلى كل شيء وعرفت أو بعد بيوا تتيك بس ناريشن أبو الوفاء سنة ولا عمري سري رحمة الله عليه كوتيد وتيت علم الأولين والآخرين في إيسوليشن then how is it that the مذهب of أهل السنة والجماعة or the مذهب of أهل الحديث is to reconcile with all the narrations that can be found within the Quran and within the Sunnah that are authentic 
and collectively without isolating or rejecting or abandoning any of the narrations to come with a conclusive sound understanding and comprehension of all the narrations and this would only mean that we would have to say as we mentioned firstly the ilm al-awwalin wal akhirin in first to al-ilm al-shar'i that was granted before to those who come came before the Prophet ﷺ and after them our Prophet ﷺ was granted them. and it goes against what the fuqaha have said the fuqaha which we mentioned last week or three Qazi Khan we mentioned him we also mentioned uh, from Sana'ul Lafani Pati and we also mentioned another jurist as well who all negated the fact that the Prophet ﷺ did not have knowledge of the unseen. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear in Surah Al Ahqaf, ayah number nine, where Allah says, Qul ma kuntu bid'ana rusuli, wa ma adri ma yuf'alu bi wala bikum, in attabi'u illa ma yuha ilayya, wa ma ana illa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa to say, I am not something original amongst the message, no what will be done with me or with you. Okay? This is what you're listening to. That I do not know that what will be done with me or with you. I only follow that which is revealed to me. In And I am not but a clear owner. The Sheikh says, Sheikh again he continues, he says, it can also be argued and said that the understanding of this narration, the Shaykh gives another understanding. He says, okay, let me give you another understanding of this narration of Utitu Ilmul Awwalina Wal Akhirin can also be referring to those incidents and stories of the previous people that can be found in the Quran and the Sunnah. Which in reality is not to be considered to be from the knowledge of the unseen. Al Ghayb al Mutraq. That the narrations of the, the, the stories of the perished nations that happened, I mentioned to you that this is Al Ghaybun Nisbi. Why? Because for those who witnessed and were from amongst the people of those prophets and were from amongst the perished nations, then what happened to them was something which was not knowledge of the unseen. Because they witnessed that. So the Sheikh is saying that you can also be referring to this. And that he could be referring to the incidents and the stories. That That I was given knowledge of the incidents and the stories that happened with regards to the people that came before me. Al awwali And I've also been given knowledge of those who will come after me before the day of judgment. Of what will happen to the people, how they will be perished, how the jail will come. And how they will be tried, and all these things that have been mentioned with regards to Ashratu Sa'a, that the knowledge with regards to them has been given to me. And this is the reason why the Shaykh says of the unseen that this was not from Al Ghayb al Mutlam. The reason being that whatever Allah taught and informed His Messenger, nobody denies that everything that has been mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah with regards to the previous perished nations or the previous people. Or the people to come, and nobody denies this that this was knowledge that was given to the Prophet in the Quran. And this is something which is not disputed or rejected that this knowledge of the perished nations and the knowledge of the signs of the day of judgment or certain things that will happen in the near future that the Prophet knew or was given by Allah, nobody disputes or argues with regards to this knowledge. The argument between us and the people of Beda is with regards to a prophet and a messenger or a saint having knowledge of the unseen. Ilmul Ghaib, Al Ghaib al Mutra. Whenever Ilmul Ghaib is mentioned by the ulama by itself, it always refers to Al Ghaib al Mutra. And this is now claimed by many people. By this, Alhamdulillah, we have completed the chapter of Ilmul Ghaib in brief. What is pending now is the explanation of the hadith of At Tirmidhi. And when the Prophet ﷺ said, فَتَجَلَّى لِي كُلُّ شَيْءٍ وَعَرَفْتُ And everything was disclosed to me and I became, I had knowledge of it or I know of it. But now we have made it clear that the aqeedah 
So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam knows knowledge of the unseen. If anybody is to believe this, then this is an aqidah of kufr and shirk. If anybody believes that other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, somebody knows knowledge of the unseen, whether it's the Sufi saint, the sheikhs, saints living or dead, then it is impermissible to pray behind such people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best.